Hi, guys. Welcome to Real Food Recovery. We are on episode 36. This is going to be a really good one, and I think people are going to relate to this. It's about self-care, and self-care isn't selfish. So before we get into it, I got to say hi to my partner, Jamie. What's happening, man? Hey, hey, Paige. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Love this topic. It's a very timely topic for me this week. Mm -hmm. So awesome. You know, what's interesting is I was literally just in a conversation with someone right before we started filming and they were talking about how they, they use the word selfish, that it was selfish. It was, it's a mother taking mm -hmm. the time to do this food prep and the other things that it's required when she should be doing some other household chores. And so we had a very long, nice conversation. I'll see if, if we've got time, I'll tell more about that and our discoveries with that. But uh, let me just start out this episode by saying we understand in recovery that it is about so much more than the food. We know obesity is about addiction, not an eating disorder. For example, when you go to weight loss programs, their only focus is on losing weight. And mm -hmm. then after the weight is done off, then we're back to these old patterns. So we're hungrier than ever. Yes. And an emotional pain that drives us back into the food. So that being said, we have got to address the addiction and all the components that go along with it. So today we are specifically talking about self-care and how mm -hmm. self-care is not selfish, yeah. as well as highlight what an important part it plays in recovery. Yeah. When we talk about self-care not being selfish, we have to look at what selfish really is, what selfishness really is. Mm -hmm. Being selfish means there's a desire to take from others, take from others, often to their detriment. Uh -huh. However, self-care is about replenishing our own resources without depleting someone else's. So it's the it's it's essentially a, a boundary in action. Self-care is a means of restoring your own energy, which promotes health and physical and emotional well-being. So, so how do we define self-care? What does yeah. it look like? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I bet people differ in their opinions on this. But for me, it's simply about making sure my basic needs are met first. My core daily basics are sleep, food, exercise, and spirituality. Yeah. And, and really self-care, as you mentioned, as you described, is exactly the way that I would describe it as well. And it's recovery in action for me. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely recovery in action. It's all the branches of recovery that we talk about in Real Food Recovery mm -hmm. and during our, our uh, connections calls in our community. It is absolutely every aspect of it addresses self-care, of those branches addresses self-care. I know. I love that so much. And I'm not going to get on off on a tangent now, but really whenever you are taking care of yourself, it's just, it literally affects every other aspect of your life. So we've all heard these announcements on the plane before. I'm actually taking off on a plane tomorrow about ladies and gentlemen, put your oxygen mask on first, but before you can help other people's, you should be in a position where you have made sure that you are taken care of because otherwise you're no good. Right. So the question becomes, what does it look like to put on your oxygen mask first, Jamie? I think that it really matters for me in scheduling my needs as a priority. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can even call it, you know, doctor's orders. And, and I, it's not necessarily that I'm better or worse than other people, or it's really just about how can I make sure that I am helping myself so that I can help others. Yeah. That's really I like what it that. Comes down to. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's funny that you um, talked about scheduling your needs as a priority because that conversation I was referring to earlier, a lot of it actually was about organization. When we kept peeling it back, um, the, the bigger concern wasn't time that I'm being selfish with my time it was the organization that it really takes to accomplish everything. So I love what you brought mm -hmm. up the point about prioritizing those needs. So literally on my schedule, I map out time for meeting my basic needs. Yes. As I had mentioned before, no one is coming to save me. We've had a big conversation about that. No one is going to come help you out. You've got to do it for yourself mm -hmm. and no one else cares how I sleep, eat, exercise, or if I had a spiritual connection that right. day. Did I mention no one? I mean, literally no one's going to <laughs> check in on me with that. So as a responsible adult, I have no one to blame. 
if right. it doesn't happen right and if it doesn't get done so it has to be a top priority in my schedule if it's going to mm -hmm. happen what agree about you? yeah it's a huge it's a huge recovery and a huge life lesson for me mm -hmm. i spent years and the opposite mindset, unfortunately, waiting for someone to show me how to do this for myself. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, I don't how'd know. How'd it work? How'd it work uh, yeah. out? <laughs> uh, uh, abysmal. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that that was the way that life was supposed to be lived. I, yeah. I don't, I, I often wonder like, what was I thinking? Was it because nobody ever told me, mm -hmm. you know, really like I never really had that kind of level of parenting. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't really know exactly where I developed this, this expectation that others would kind of come and show me what to do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm guessing it developed in childhood. I don't remember being particularly coddled, but yeah. I think I probably was. <laughs> I didn't know it, right? Uh -huh. I know I was coddled when I was sick. We've talked about that. I know yeah. I was coddled when, we, when I was sick, but I don't think that I was coddled in general. I did mm -hmm. a lot of, for myself by myself, but uh, mm -hmm. maybe that was also where there was a gap for for knowledge and, and education, and I didn't I didn't receive it. Um, yeah. So I have totally remade this part of my life. I'm so grateful to God for helping me do that because yeah. I just didn't know they're really like that, that I was it. I, I'm the rescue ship. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a huge point to make. So one of the things too, that we like to talk about in self-care is learning to say no. Are you comfortable saying no? Mm -hmm. Have you gotten better with time and maturity? I know I have. Mm -hmm. It was not, it didn't not come to me naturally. It's something I had to work on big maturing curve with that you know, I try to avoid conflict as much as possible. It pains me, but time to grow up and deal with life. And this is a better system of being able to say no and uh, what your boundaries are. Yeah. Boundaries are something I learned out of necessity and they really do pay dividends every time I use them. Mm -hmm. But here's, here's the thing with, with boundaries. You know, I read this great quote today about burnout. And, mm -hmm. you know, burnout is a very hot topic, especially in the industry that I, I make my living through, you know, in healthcare. And we hear people talk all the time about burnout and burnout and burnout and burnout and oh my gosh, burnout. And this writer who I really love, and she's got a, she's got a, several books and a, a big following on social media and online. And she wrote, you know, boundaries, excuse me, um, burnout is really just an, an, a, a signal or a symptom of someone who has not learned how to set appropriate boundaries. Yeah. Wow. But, yep. That, Ugh, that sums just hit it me up. in the chest. Yeah. That's it true. Because up. who would, who would burn out if they had a, a healthy balance in everything exactly. they're doing? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now I'm not saying that this is something that people inherently should know how to do like, like self-care, like, you know, um, prioritizing my own needs and, and to, in and, taking good care of myself. That wasn't something that was really taught to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so boundaries were not taught to me. Um, I had to learn those as part of my recovery journey. Interesting. I'm still learning. I'm still learning how to exercise them every day. Yeah. It's a practice, right? Yeah. So I've mentioned movement as part of my daily self-care routine. How big of an impact does exercise make when trying to take good care of yourself? Does it really matter? Oh my gosh. For me, literally, <laughs> I have to have it to keep a balanced mood. I thrive on that endorphin kick. Mm -hmm. I miss it. I notice if if it ain't there, me notices. Yes. So I, and I love seeing some of the definition that I work so hard on with my muscles. I have a little definition in my arms and I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. this is working. So, um, and keeping up a hard cardio workout and leaving it all on the mat. I, I, that's worth it for me. I don't kill myself every day, but the days I do, I, well, I always get an endorphin kick, but you know, right. there's a little extra rush to pushing your, yourself a little bit, but there is no big healthier thrill than to finish a good workout, not to mention confidence booster. I don't know yes. what it is, but that just carry that high seems to carry me throughout the rest of the day. And it also gives me a sense of just kind it, it settles me down too at the same time it gives me a high but i'm settled down all at the same time if that makes sense yes yes uh i've talked about it here before it, for me exercise is not about 
the, the physical benefits, even though it is, it's a huge amount of physical benefits, but I don't do it for the physical benefits. I do it because I want to um, do it for my head, do it for my, yeah. my you know, the benefits of age, for aging and, and of course, uh, any kind of bone density benefits. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Mm-hmm. But those are, those are sort of secondary benefits to me. The, for me, I do all of my movement for my head. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah, it's, it keeps me off um, medicine. <laughs> that's for sure. So if uh, taking a time out during the day is also part of my self-care routine, mm-hmm. this can take many forms. It's whatever you need, meditation, nap, a few minutes on social media, or just filing your nails. But I have got to put myself in time out. I won't have that opportunity today. I usually fit it in. Today's just an extraordinary day because I'm mm-hmm. trying to get things together for traveling. But normally for me, a 20 minute nap, it's a game changer. And it's when I put, I am my best when I put myself in timeout, just like when you're a, a child misbehaving, you, you come out of the timeout a little bit better, but that's right. Um, everyone benefits when I have had my little downtime. I, you know, people that are listening, I would love to hear what your perfect nap time is. Put those uh, numbers in the chat or in the comment section, I have heard 20 minutes is best, but I also, someone said the other day, oh no, I I read this big study and they said 27 minutes. That is the perfect time for a nap. And I'm like, okay, then I'll go to 27. Yeah. Twist my arm. (laughs) Twist my arm. Uh, Yeah. I'm a big, uh, I, I don't, I try to do them daily, but there's some days that I find I don't need them and other days that I find I need them but uh, I will do usually about half an hour if I can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will schedule it if I need to schedule it. If I know, yeah. like if, and it's not that I schedule it in the morning. Usually I, as the day progresses, I'm, if I see an open half an hour and I feel like I need it, I'll take it. Uh, and there are, there are many days in the last few weeks, for instance, that I have not taken it. Um, and I just, it's, I was just kind of going and moving can really fast tell? and didn't think. And yes, yes, it catches up for me. It catches mm-hmm. up. I even put it in my Google calendar. Yeah. Oh, I, if, <laughs> if it was something that I could, I felt like I could guard, I would mm-hmm. not, not every day. Can I guard it some days, most days, but, um, you know, one thing that really helped me from a self-care perspective was embracing a hobby, mm-hmm. tapping into the right side of my brain and getting mm-hmm. the creative juices flowing really, really helps. Mm-hmm. In other words, I found a distraction from everyday stress. And not food and not shopping and not, you know, I don't know, <laughs> online surfing. Yeah. Uh, it helps keep things in perspective. Do you have a hobby page? Well, don't laugh, but really I'm a scrapbooker and I used to have all the stickers and um, construction paper and, and doing all that. It would take me an hour, you know, for four or six p- pictures to get in. And I, I mean, I, I just can't do that. We, we've got, you know, five kids and now nine grandkids. I'm just slapping those suckers in there. And you know what? The, everybody likes to look at them, but I just label them and go on. But scrapbooking really, and I'm starting to read. I don't know if you can call that a hobby, but it's yeah. something that I enjoy. Grandkids mm-hmm. are part of my hobbies. Actually, um, I admire people so much that do these really crafty things. I was talking in one of our uh, connections hour last night to someone who not only does she knit, but she spins her own fabric Wow! and, and she just happened to be wearing this beautiful blue sweater. And she had been talking about being at, at a knitting event that weekend. I said, your sweater so beautiful. You, you didn't make that. I mean, it looked like something you would get in the store. It was gorgeous. She goes, Oh yeah. I made this. So, and she's talking about learning different stitches and weaving Mm -hmm. and all that. And I'm like, wow, that's so admirable. I could never knit something that I would put on and go out in public in, (laughs) but it was beautiful. Everything. I mean, I just admire people so much for doing those types of things. Do you have hobbies? Yeah. I, I, I knit not like that. I, I make my dog a scarf and I'm in the middle of, for the last almost two years, making my husband a scarf. It'll be two years in November. This poor man. And, uh, the dog got the scarf first in case I really screwed up. So 
my husband's <laughs> scarf is is gorgeous and it's i really need to finish it especially if we're going to be transitioning up here to new jersey but uh i i love anything to do with biking and cycling indoor outdoor um and that's a hobby for for me biking is a hobby because it's 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 beyond just a workout if i'm outside on my on my bike it's a hobby it's something that brings me great joy i i like to tinker with my bike and and buy buy used bikes and fix it up and all of that oh, that's fun. i like learning how to how to fix them and how to overcome the challenges of them mm-hmm. um teaching myself how to mm-hmm. ride and other things too um i i do enjoy reading um it depends what i read i read a lot for work so mm-hmm. so when i don't when i if i if it's after work it's got to be something really high value a really mm-hmm. you know well done highly recommended book or a, if it's self-help it's got to be something i'm really interested in um only because i'd rather spend my time moving or being outside than sitting more so yeah. Yeah, I find if I can have a book going, I just try and read a few pages before bed. And yeah. in our um, online recovery community, we talk a lot about being uh, a student of the game. Mm-hmm. And so I like to encourage people to have some type of book or podcast or YouTube video or something to uh, just increase that stimulating Mm -hmm. thoughts about what we're doing here in recovery. But before we move on, I have to tell you something funny. You Mm -hmm. were talking about knitting your husband a scarf (laughs) and it brought me back to middle school when I was taking sewing. I thought that was so cool to take sewing, but Mm -hmm. I, all I wanted to do was the wrap around skirt because I didn't want to do anything with the zipper. Uh, I was trying to outsmart the system. That's hilarious. (laughs) Yeah. So I got a couple of wraparound skirts that I I maybe wore once or twice. And my mother got me the ugliest material. So I I think maybe I wore it once, but it must have been on sale, that material. Oh, how funny. (laughs) So another part of self-care is being kind, not to others, silly, but to yourself. We never have to remind ourselves to be nice to others. It comes naturally but are you as kind to yourself as you are to others? I've heard people, uh, there's some saying out there, treat yourself like you would a stranger. Mm-hmm. Um, so try to say three nice things to yourself in the mirror. Give yourself a pep talk when needed. Uh, be your biggest cheerleader. And, mm-hmm. th- you know, I have to stop and, and ask myself, how am I doing with that kindness department? And I think think I do pretty good in uh, the kindness department. I think that's a strength in my life. I'm trying to do my best every day to do right by myself as well as others. I think I'm just hardwired for that, for goodwill for myself and others. I I just happen to get lucky and that I've got a very tender personality in that Mm -hmm. respect. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I think that's something that I had to, for me, I had to learn because I was unfortunately growing up, not by everyone, but by enough folks in my life, I was spoken to very harshly or judgmentally, mm-hmm. uh, or um, it was a lot of criticism. And so I just learned that that's how you were supposed to talk to others. I mm-hmm. And I brought that with me to myself, my, my self-care, really, which is mm-hmm. of course the opposite of it. Uh, brought it with me into my first marriage. Brought I just didn't understand that that's not how you spoke to people because that's how we mm. were spoken to. And, and right. that was just what, what my family did. And so, um, I, the whole idea of being kind to myself is something that is new to me, um, mm. in the last few years being, you know, intentionally kind and curious and, you know, um, connected to what, mm-hmm. what I have to say inside. That's something. And it's, it's just a, it's a game changer. It really is a game changer. Oh, totally. You know, I'm glad you said that because we talk a lot in our uh, community about Mm self-talk and that is a game changer. It changes everything. You can literally change the message in your ear That's right, and it will change outcomes in your life. It's that big. So I'm glad you brought that up. And that's why we, and that's why I would say it's a, it's of course, it's one of our branches of recovery, but it's a very, very popular branch that people bring up yeah. and talk about on a regular yeah, basis. Yeah, it affects li- literally every other aspect of recovery, yeah. I believe. It does. So all these things being said, this is actually not a complete list, right? So the self-care, we just hit on some of the highlights. Mm-hmm. We really have to find what works for us and what speaks loudest to our individual psyches. 
what works for some may not work for others. Again, like Paige is talking about how she, you know, reading is an act of self-care for me. An act of self-care is yoga, mm -hmm. uh, you know, over reading mm -hmm. because I, I, it allows me to move my muscles and stretch things and, mm -hmm. and reconnect with my body uh, in a way that's very rewarding to me. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's really necessary for each of us to discover our own self-care routines and what works for us and then make it a priority. So if we, if we think about that, right, keeping this in mind, prioritizing and, and exploring self-care, is it normal to feel overwhelmed from time to time? And what do you do when that happens, Paige? I, yeah, I'm so glad that we're talking about this because I'm going to tell you what I, just that conversation I was having before we started, it yeah. really, we were talking about self-care, but when we kept peeling it back, it really just came to the point of organization. And if you could up the organization a little bit, you wouldn't feel as selfish about self-care because the other stuff would be done. Like one of the things was clean as you go with the dishes or clean as you go with housework mm -hmm. or get up 10 or 15 minutes earlier to do a little prep work for dinner that night if you won't be home again. So a lot of it came down to organization mm -hmm. and that the strong length between those two. But for me, when I feel overwhelmed, I need to stop and take a breath, yeah. reorganize myself. And then I just start prioritizing what needs to get done first. Mm -hmm. And it really does settle me down. And mm -hmm. I know when I start getting overwhelmed, I might even say to myself, okay, you got to settle down here. You just, just let's simmer down. Let's take a beat. And, uh, Let's get a grip here because I can't yeah. function in that chaotic state. So mm -hmm. it helps put things back into perspective. And I just am able to get my thoughts together. And I just don't like that jittery out of control feeling. No, no, I, uh, when I get overwhelmed, I, I, that's when, again, the last seven years or so, that's when really the self-care and self-talk comes into play mm -hmm. where I will say, okay, you know, sweetheart, you're, you're feeling a little overwhelmed. <laughs> Take a deep breath. This is all going to be okay. We're, what do we need to do first? What do we need to do after that? What's our next right move? If if I really don't know which direction to go, I will, I will kind of take a pause, take a time out, mm -hmm. do some prayer and, and wait for answers around what, um, what I could do differently as the next step. And that really does help me. You know, this is so interesting you saying that because it ties into uh, several conversations that we've had that we keep talking about processing emotions and you are famous for saying, just stop and ask yourself, what do you need? I mean, it's the same way with when you're overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't always think of that as emotions, but if you just stop and say to yourself, okay, what do I need here to get back on track? How right. do I need to do that? That's another way that we settle ourselves down. And of course we want to stay calm because if we get stressed out, then those craving pathways come alive and we don't want to have to deal with that either. Exactly. So love exactly. that conversation. So obviously because we are humans and we live in life, sometimes things get in the way of taking care of ourselves. And for me, it depends on the days, but schedules can change and you have to be able to adapt at a moment's notice. Interestingly, again, in um, uh, one of our connections hours this morning, mm -hmm. we were talking about plan B, the power of plan B, mm -hmm. especially with, for people in recovery. It's It makes the difference between success and failure if you mm -hmm. have a backup plan ready to go and you're able to adapt easily. So true. That so, but this is life, right? Self care may not always happen like planned, and just like I may not get my nap in today, but I'm going to be a big girl <laughs> and yeah. and deal with it and run off adrenaline. But just know that you can start over tomorrow, and yes. the best laid plans. Obviously, we know the end of that right. statement. Right. Um, I'm not super rigid if life throws a monkey wrench into the mix from time to time, but being adaptable, huge part of self care yes. huge. and recovery. I agree. Yes, I agree. That's um really just being adaptable is helping me when something gets in the way of taking care of myself. And sometimes it will be, you know, I will put a boundary down and say, I really don't feel well, or I, I can't do this, or I said I could, and I thought I could, but I really just can't. And I'm very sorry. Um, It help, just helps me stay aligned to my values, to be honest, or, you know, in integrity about whatever I'm, I'm saying no to. And I remember a great phrase. Every time you say no to something, you're 
opening up the option to say yes to something yeah. else. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So mm -hmm. that is, that helps me a lot. Um, Paige, do you think self-care is becoming more of a priority in our culture from where we were 50 years ago or even 10 years ago? You know, I, I think it's, I hate to use the, it's a buzzword, but I definitely <laughs> think people are becoming way more aware of it. I, you know, I think of all the mental and physical health benefits that flow from self-care. I definitely think we've come a long way. So I've talked before about my parents. They both grew up on farms in Southern Illinois. And as a female, I don't ever remember hearing my mother talking about self-care of being part of her childhood or quite frankly, even her as an adult. You know, when, when my parents were kids, you just did your job and that was it. And you tried to get food. I mean, you tried to m milk the cows and feed the mm -hmm. pigs and right. collect the eggs from the chickens. And just, there are seven kids in my mom's family. And I, she's told this story so often about mama would put the food on the middle of the dining room table and people, whoever was fastest got the most of whatever was on there. But so they, these people, they didn't have plumbing, you know, that that's, you just self-care was not a high priority back then. So, and right. ain't, ain't nobody, yeah. Ain't nobody was talking about feelings either. So yeah. you were just trying to plow the fields and survive. So definitely, I think our culture moving out of the farms and more to city folk type living has industrialized, the industrialized nation that we live in has changed things quite a bit. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, I think that that's a, a good thing. And I think it's also, a, uh, it remains to be seen because, you know, self-care can be taken to extremes where it does mm -hmm. become selfish, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it becomes about putting your own needs, uh, uh, excuse me, your own wants above others. And that can be a very selfish place to live or to, to assume that other people should take care of, of your feelings or to assume other people should care for your, uh, your needs, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, that's self-care. So other people need to sort of, you know, clear their schedules for my self-care. Mm -hmm. There's a boundary there, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if, if you want, if you need to practice these things for, for you, then you need to figure out how to make them work in your schedule mm -hmm. and make them work with everything else that you're trying to balance. And if you can't, then that's an indication that you've probably overextended yourself. Yeah. And again, <laughs> not another person's responsibility to fix that for you. Your yeah. responsibility to fix that for you. A fabulous point. Yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah, I just, do you have one thing that you think you'd name as your number one in self-care? Well, <laughs> I am a broken record, but I can't tell you how much I am grateful for my food prep. I was again, having the same, uh, another conversation with someone this morning about my last few days have been so wacky that literally I am grabbing as fast as I can. And I hate to say wolfing it down, but I, I mean that I, had I not had things ready, I don't know what would have become of the past couple of days when right. you are just doing Lamaze breathing, just try to get from one thing when you are scheduled from thing to thing. Right. Right. So I, I mean, I, it, I would be a mess. I would have a messy life. I would be a mess if I did not have things ready for me to grab and go literally yeah. in an instant. And I have to tell you, my sleep is right there with that food prep. I protect mm -hmm. my sleep so much. What Do you have a number one? Yeah, I would say it's food prep for me or just, uh, for me, it's just, whether it's food prep or just making sure that my food is, is available if it's something that I don't want to prep in, in advance or can't be prepped in advance mm -hmm. I just make sure that it's ready to be grabbed and put into whatever I'm making yeah That's, that that to me counts as food prep um and then I would say probably movement and then sleep mm. they're, they're, they're oh, really close, close second and third because mm -hmm. I have so much natural cortisol in the mornings and that mm -hmm. really helps me dissipate it mm -hmm. um plus it just again for my head it just is the best thing for me Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say sleep again is a, is a close third, if not a, a tie for a second. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, it's, I've had to prioritize those things. It used to be, you know, so True. different, so different self-care looked like eating a 
big meal of processed foods and mm -hmm. laying on the sofa watching TV all day. That's what mm -hmm. self care used to look like. To me. <laughs> binging, binging media, binging food. Right. Binging yeah. Junk, that's junk really thoughts. taking care of yourself and having a good time, right? That's, yeah. That's what I used to think was <laughs> self care. And I, I know better now. And, and you know what? People say, oh, well, that, that's your self care. This is mine. That self care was putting me on the path. That kind of self care was putting me on the path of being really, really sick and really yeah, dead on yeah. society to give me medication and health support yeah. and, and and putting an immense burden on my family. Right. That's such. I mean, I don't think that's being overly dramatic. Do you? No. Yeah. I mean, that's that type of self care is just shortening your life mm -hmm. and making your life a, a sick ending a really yeah. sick ending, miserable ending that, um, Alan gold, Goldhammer Is that mm -hmm. how you say his name? Mm -hmm. He taught when I've heard him being interviewed and this is in his book, um, the pleasure trap about our society set up to make us fat, sick, and miserable mm -hmm. that, and because we've glamorized that idea of laying in bed, eating Doritos and peanut M&Ms and with a diet it's Coke crazy. and, it's you crazy. know, just, Taking a day off means laying in bed all day, just eating junk food. So yeah. Yeah. So last point, we since we know that if we ignore self-care, we're most likely to, we're going to face those physical symptoms of stress, problem sleeping, binge eating, and other unhealthy habits, as you just you know mentioned some. So if self-care feels like a chore rather than a reminder to find and appreciate enjoyment in everyday life, it is a sign that something needs to change. So mm -hmm. if you feel like self-care is a slog, mm -hmm. chances are you have drastically overextended yourself in <laughs> yeah. some area of your life. Mm -hmm. And if you don't address it, your body will take over and start addressing it for you. Yes, very true. And we don't want that. We don't want mm -hmm. that. That's why we're here. So listener questions. Okay. What's you, the first one, Paige? Okay. I know self-care is important, but I just don't have time. Not to mention energy. I work full-time and have a family with dinner and laundry, and all I want to do is sit in front of the TV when I have a minute. So first off, we understand. We get it. We have those same feelings, too. It's not like that we don't feel that way. <laughs> so we understand right. perfectly. These are hard years with a young family, but when it comes to your mental health, Self-care can help you manage stress, lower your risk of illness, and actually increase your energy. Even small acts of self-care in your daily life can have a, a big impact. And Jamie Agreed. and I were just talking about what's number one for us. Everybody has their own number one. And sometimes number one can shuffle from day to day. Very true. Very true. So second question, uh, do I have to do big acts of self-care to be effective? Mm -hmm. No. No, not at all. It's, it's incremental. It could be incremental. It could be one little thing. And, and I find that, that the momentum usually takes it from there Yeah, uh, and it builds upon itself because you realize mm -hmm. how, how much better you feel um, there, you know, when it comes to my movement, self-care things that I've done to, to get extra movement are, you know, parking further away, taking the mm -hmm. stairs versus the elevator. Oh, I'm a, I am a queen of that at my sites. <laughs> my hospitals. I, I, I'm always, you know, if I'm walking Park down around, the block. Marked on the block or from walking down the hallway with a, with a leader or a coworker, I'll all of a sudden turn as they're going into the elevator banks, I'll turn to go find the stairs and they're like, yeah. where'd you go? I'm like, I'm taking the stairs. Good, good um, girl. And those are, it, but it helps. It really does help. And I'll tell you the leaders that are in that stairwell with me are, are very successful. They're, they're at the mm -hmm. top of their game. They're, they're highly regarded people. They are, they, they get it they get it and they, they walk the talk and they're in that stairwell with me. Yeah. I, like I mentioned, I'm flying tomorrow and I will look for the stairs versus yes. the escalator. Absolutely. Even if Absolutely. I have my carry on bag and my backpack on, I can still walk up. That's just Absolutely. a little extra strength training. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and you know, there's lots of things that you can do, right. To make sure you're getting your water in, right. You have it next to you at all times. Mm -hmm. That's something that I do on a regular basis, get enough sleep. They're all simply, you know, manageable things that we can do and you can even i i multitask while i'm driving or cooking so i'll listen to a podcast or an audiobook while i'm driving cooking getting ready in the mornings if i if i don't have a meeting to be on it's just a it's a great a great help yeah 
Um, you know, yeah, listening to our podcast at Real Food Recovery. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so our last listener question is, how do I make self-care a priority, especially over other needs? We've talked about this a little bit, but honestly, it's a skill set like anything else. It takes prioritizing and a little bit of organizing and being on top of things. It, it, there is time to fit it in if it really is a priority, I promise you that. So with some awareness, we can start making small changes. Don't start out with big changes, just small doable steps. If you can't do everything, what can you do? What's one small thing that you can do mm -hmm. starting today? I think once you see how good prioritizing yourself feels, it may urge you to continue to foster that relationship with yourself and recognizing that you have value changes everything. Yep. It helps set boundaries that we've talked about. When you value yourself, the boundaries are just a natural offshoot of valuing yep. yourself. And it, it really just opens the door for us to be our best self. So this Agreed. was a great episode, really yes. important stuff. We Very would love so. to hear your comments. Please leave them for us if, if you feel so inclined, but most of all, we're just happy you were here with us today. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks all. I will see you soon on the next episode of Real Food Recovery. And in the meantime, check out our new website, realfoodrecovery4u.com, number four, letter U. You can find all the information for our community on there. It's a really amazing place. We're doing a lot of healing with people yeah. and uh, we'd love you to check it out. Thanks guys. See you next time. Bye-bye.